Today we have a testimony from a, a wonderful new member of our parish. His name is Dennis Lasky. Dennis has uh, just moved to Atlanta, to Duluth area in particular, in May, and he's from Chicago. He's also an RCA convert and has just recently converted to the Catholic faith in the past year, just over this past Easter. So we are blessed to have him come here today and speak with us and tell us his perspective on baptism and how it has um, shaped his life. And so at this time, we're going to welcome up Dennis, Dennis Lasky. I've always wanted to test, 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 check, 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 check. Pray with me, please. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have protected us through this night from all danger and harm. And we pray that you would preserve and keep us this day also from all sin and evil, so that in all our thoughts, words, and deeds, we may serve and please you. Into your hands we commend our bodies and souls and all that is ours. Let your holy angel have charge concerning us that the wicked one have no power over us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I am indeed Dennis Lasky. I was born in 1949 to a working class family in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I lived until I went to college and then after college for four years later. My dad understood himself to be an Irish Catholic and my mom was British and German and had been raised a Methodist. As the Irish would like to say, my dad was green, my mom was orange. <laughs> One month after my birth, I was baptized at St. Joachim's Roman Catholic Church. And I'll finish my introduction in a little bit. This was my wife, Lizzie. Ours was a second marriage for both of us. Lizzie was a widow. She was a cradle Catholic, but a disillusioned one. Even so, she was completely culturally Catholic. Her maiden name was Gizelli, and her first husband was named Mulhern. Uh, her maternal, her paternal grandmother was Polish. But uh, somewhere in there, her mom, Lucille Schramm, had snuck in and she was a Missouri Synod Lutheran. Lucille and I could talk. <laughs> Lizzie had a real special affection for Joseph Cardinal Bernadine, the Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago, because uh, Cardinal Bernadine suffered from the same disease which had taken her husband, which was pancreatic cancer. And um, Lizzie and I uh, began our relationship shortly after Cardinal Bernadine's death. And as such, we would often visit the grave of her husband and the tomb of Cardinal Bernadine, who were buried both at Queen of Heaven Cemetery in suburban Chicago. There we would often offer prayers at this crucifix, that's it, upon which, uh, just a short time before we started to go there, there had been an apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And it was here that we came for prayer in June of 2015, shortly after Lizzie had been diagnosed with small cell lung cancer. She was given six to nine months to live. And we went there, we prayed for the usual things, you know, we prayed for healing and for peace. 
But I think we prayed most ardently um, to St. Francis uh, for the care of our cats. <laughs> However, I went one step further, fortunately, I think, um, because I made a vow that I would return to my faith if she would be helped. And she lived for 26 months. Oh, there it is. All this technology, <laughs> the world's changed since I did this before. <laughs> After she passed, we needed a place to have prayers said for her. And I investigated the local Roman Catholic parish and at Notre Dame in Clarendon Hills, Illinois, I found him, Father David, about whom at least two things are special. The first is that Father David was an old friend of mine. In fact, he had been a student of mine in the years that he was preparing to become a Lutheran minister, which leads then to the second rather special thing because Father David is a convert to Catholicism and was received into the Catholic Church and subsequently into the priesthood as a married man. He's one of a few, about 150, married Catholic priests. Change is slow. While making these arrangements for the prayers for Liz, Father David asked me about my soul. What was I going to do going forward? Oops, be careful what you vow. You know, it was on a dark and stormy night uh, that Martin Luther was going home after uh, a visit and a terrible storm came and uh, knocked him to the ground and he said, St. Anne, save me, I'll become a monk. She did and so did he. And the rest of that story, of course, is history. Father David and I talked about the fact that I was a baptized Roman Catholic, and he reminded me that perhaps even though I had quite a bit of baggage that I was carrying at the time, maybe the sacrament of reconciliation might help. Oh boy, now you really have to be careful when you've been asked to make confession but I did it, and it did. By way of finishing my introduction, this is what I remember about church as a young man. This is my earliest memory, the banks of votive candles in the Grotto Church at St. Barlow. Bartholomew's Roman Catholic Parish in the Wissanoming section of Philadelphia. I remember going there when my dad would go for confession and mass on Saturdays and Sundays, but more so I remember going there on Saturday afternoons when the necessity of all of my Irish Catholic friends to make their confession before mass on Sunday interrupted seasonally the sporting events scheduled for that particular Saturday, whether it be football in the fall or baseball and basketball in the spring and summer. In fact, I began to think that I was just always lurking about in the narthex of Roman Catholicism. I did my Cub Scouting there, Boy Scouting, sang in the Christmas pageant, all those places, all at St. Bart's Roman Catholic Parish in Philadelphia. Then neighbors and friends of my parents intervened in my sister and my religious ambiguity and I was sent to this church where I attended Sunday school, took catechesis and was confirmed in 1963. In 1974, I was ordained a pastor in the Lutheran Church in America. I received a PhD in church history in 1983 and served as a pastor 
in that church until personal problems led me to resign from that ministry, provoking again the religious ambiguity in which I languished until Father David's challenge and invitation to private sacramental reconciliation. Now, it's not that I was unfamiliar whoops, with confession. In fact, Lutheranism um, is founded on the whole issue of what constitutes proper penance. Every time we celebrated Holy Communion, which back in those days was but once a month because you had to take this seriously and it was not to become too common, we began our service of uh, public confession with a rather extensive exhortation, as you see, which then led to prayer, and then an examination of conscience once a month. I ask you, in the presence of God who searches the heart, do you confess your sins? Will you trust entirely in the mercy of Christ? Do you promise to forgive others as you've been forgiven? And then we would be invited to kneel. Yes, kneel in a Protestant church and say a confidier. And then, of course, while still kneeling, the pastor would rise, and I did, and offer absolution to the congregation. But just to make sure that everyone really understood what was happening, the pastor would then say, on the other hand, by the same authority, I declare to the impenitent and the unbelieving <clears throat> that so long as they continue in their impenitence, God hath not forgiven their sins and will assuredly visit their iniquities on them if they do not turn from their evil ways and come to true repentance and faith ere the day of grace be ended. Um, for anyone to suggest that Lutherans didn't understand penance or take it seriously, listen to those words when you're 11. <clears throat> in, 19, in 1529, Luther wrote uh, a, a beautiful piece called The Large Catechism. <clears throat> it was intended for um, use by pastors, uh, seminary professors, and so forth. And he returns to the issue of penitence um, in the discussion of baptism. Let me uh, read a couple of these passages for you. Therefore, the old man, you recognize him, the old man, goes unrestrained in his nature if he is not checked and suppressed by the power of baptism. On the other hand, where men have become Christians, he daily increases, he daily decreases, that is the old man, daily decreases until he finally perishes. That is truly to be buried in baptism and daily to come forth again. Therefore, the external sign, the water, is appointed not only for a powerful effect, but also for a sign. Where therefore faith flourishes with its fruits, there it has no empty signification, but the work of mortifying the flesh accompanies it. And where faith is wanting, it remains a mere unfruitful sign. And here you see that baptism, both in its power and in its signification, comprehends this third sacrament. Lutherans have always been kind of confused as to how many sacraments there are. Luther believed that there were three, baptism, Eucharist, and confession, which has been called repentance, as it is really nothing else than baptism. For what else is repentance but an earnest attack upon the old man that his lusts be restrained and entering upon a new life? Therefore, if you live in repentance, you walk in baptism, 
which not only signifies such a new life, but also produces, begins, and exercises it. For therein are given grace, the spirit, and power to suppress the old man, so that the new man may come forth and become strong. Therefore, our baptism abides forever. And though someone should fall from it and sin, nevertheless, we always have access thereto, that we may again subdue the old man. But we need not again be sprinkled with water, for though we were put under the water a hundred times, it would nevertheless be but one baptism. Although the operation and what happened? Oh, pardon me. Repentance, therefore, is nothing else but a return and approach to baptism that we repeat and practice when we began before but abandoned. Quite consistent with, I think, what you've been studying, Luther himself never once in his life, in his adult life, missed a day of private confession, even after his excommunication. In the Lutheran church, private confession to the pastor was retained as normative until the 19th century, when private confession gave way in the, during the pietistic movement to what the Germans referred to as Seelsorge, the cure of souls, and now is called pastoral care and counseling. But in making my private sacramental confession of my admittedly innumerable sins to God and receiving the blessing of divine reconciliation, I crossed a threshold which reawakened and clarified all of my ambiguities. And I entered our CIA instruction. And the rest, as they say, is history. It's as if the gracious, loving Lord, through the ministry of Father David in Notre Dame Parish, had reached across all time and space and hit my baptismal reset button. I was, re I was confirmed and received into full communion in the Roman Catholic Church at the Vigil of Easter in 2018. My baptism at St. Joachim's Catholic Church, so long merely assumed, now played and plays a far more important role in my spiritual life for even when I fail in my walk with Christ and his church and need to have my reset button engaged again. I need but repair to the sacrament of reconciliation to put me back on the right path. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this is our time where we have table talk. And if you're all familiar with that, it's time for us to gather together. We'll have a question, which Dennis has prepared for us, where we can sit and discuss. We have about five minutes we're going to put on the clock. But here's our dialogue question for today. Have you ever felt the need for the Lord to hit your reset button? I know I have. Have you ever felt the need for the Lord to reset, to hit the reset button? It's the only question we have, so five minutes of discussion. Go ahead.
Father Jack, we can have you come up here and talk about the mission. Father Jack. All right. Mission for this week. Let's see here. Oh, morning. Okay, here we go. The morning prayer, you have now have the act of faith, the act of hope, both of those, um, and we'll move on to the act of charity. I think some, some of us may have learned those when we were younger. It's good to, when I look back at those, I think it's very excellent. Remember the, the, the three theological virtues that we receive through our baptism, faith, hope and charity, that if we just act upon those, are deepened and sanctified throughout our life. So these acts, these remembrances of what we believe, of what we hope for, and of how we live, which is with the love of Christ in our hearts, I think are really good to, to reacquaint ourselves with those prayers. And then throughout the day, you know, it's such a beautiful reality um, when Christ says, I am the light of the world. Think about that. He comes into the world as the light in the world. And what we realize is that when Christ came, the way he was going to spread that light throughout the world was through the baptized Christians, but also through his most blessed sacrament. Uh, that when John Paul II uh, instituted the uh, you know, illuminative mysteries, uh, he places the institution of Holy Communion under that. It's the fifth one, right? A mystery of light. And so one way to look at it, I was meditating before the Blessed Sacrament this morning, and I was thinking how awesome it was that within my rectory is the Blessed Sacrament, and the light is coming upon me from Christ. But not only that, but upon uh, Father Trun and Father Fom, and then with the neighbors, and then all around. And that, just like there's cell towers, there are tabernacles placed all around the world. And from those, uh, those tabernacles come the light of Christ. And that the whole world now is really covered with that light through the rays of light that come. If you look at it this way, that from that tabernacle, it, the rays of light shoot out until it hits rays of light coming from another tabernacle. Does that make sense? And we should always remember that sacramental presence of Christ, that we can access this actual grace that this light is really present. And it's a light that uh, from the outside penetrates inward in adoration. And when we see the Blessed Sacrament, it's light from the inside going outward. So that we're meant to be like the woman clothed in the sun, Mary ultimately, right? So we'll be irradiated. When we, uh, at the end of time of the judgment, God willing, receive a spiritualized body, it'll be irradiated like this. It'll be the glorious body, like the transfigured Christ on Mount Tabor, okay? So, but that's experienced in a hidden way in all the tabernacles of the world. And so, we should each day, if we can't come to receive Holy Communion at Mass, some of us have that blessing, I do. <laughs> I get to celebrate Mass every day, praise Jesus Christ. However, if you can't come to the Holy Sacrifice and Supper, then make sure you make a spiritual communion. Uh, I think I've shared this with you, but one of my favorite uh, uh, professors, a priest, Father Roach at Mount St. Mary's, at Mount St. Mary's, at the heart of the seminary was St. Bernard's Chapel. And I remember the first time I went to his class, uh, he is my favorite probably one of my, if not my favorite teacher, because um, he was really eccentric. And uh, he gave strange tests, but I could always figure out the weird questions he was going to ask. If he said something in class, said, that's really weird, I know that's going to be on the test. And everybody else would forget about it. Um, but he, whenever he'd pray in the room, he'd just face in a particular direction. He'd be like standing facing you and suddenly he'd turn this way. And then next class, we were in a different room and he'd turn this way. I was going like, what's he doing? Then I realized, oh, every time he would orient himself to face towards a tabernacle present at the heart of the seminary. And that instructed me very deeply. And I remember that understanding that he had, which is that Christ is with us now and he's in this building. 
um, really cultivated within my heart the need to spend an hour in adoration each day before the Blessed Sacrament, something that I started in seminary and have continued up until this day. But just that, think of that. He didn't say anything about what he was doing. He just did it, and it instructed very powerfully. Do you have expressions that instruct? Is there evidence in what you do? When you come to a Catholic campus, do you stop by the bus sacrament before you go anywhere else? There are certain things that instruct very powerfully. You make a sign of the cross whenever you drive past a, a church. These types of things are, are what people notice. They're what children notice. It's very important for us. They, they look and see and they, they know what's important to us. They know what we think's present and important and significant, okay? And I knew when he did that, he believed Christ is present in the Blessed Sacrament and he acknowledged that presence each day of his life. Does it make sense? Very simple thing, but for me, one of the most profound instructions that I received in my whole seminary education. You know, the sad thing was at that time, there were brothers who had gone to seminaries where they didn't believe in the in Blessed Sacrament anymore. Can you imagine that? And actually would be opposed by the teachers at those seminaries. And sometimes we're not allowed to become priests in dioceses where theologians giving false doctrine were kept as professors at seminaries. You know, when we look at the challenges we face now, we see why. Okay. And we have to pray very hard that the doctrine we practice and believe is going to be lived to the fullness. Lived to the fullness, okay? So, but anyway, this is a beautiful thing. Make a spiritual communion every day. Um, it's a beautiful prayer that you can pray if you can't come before the Blessed Sacrament. Um, you'll notice, like, for example, when uh, those who are unprepared or those who are not Catholic or those who are children come forward, I don't give them a blessing because Christ is in that Blessed Sacrament. So what I typically do is just say, may the Lord be in your heart. What am I doing? I'm inviting them to a spiritual communion. So for example, if we have funerals or weddings where there are non-Catholics, I'll say, now's the time for communion for those who are Catholic and prepared, come forward to receive the Blessed Sacraments. Those who are unprepared or non-Catholic, you may either remain in your pews praying, or if you come forward, cross your arms on your chest and bow in adoration uh, to God. Okay, so they can make an expression of their belief in the true, real presence of Christ in the most blessed sacraments. Does that make sense? And so I want to invite them, if they, if they actually believe that, invite them to do that. Or at the time when we kneel, I'll say, please kneel in adoration of our God. If you're unable to, please be seated. And when would somebody be unable to? If I don't believe that's Jesus, okay? But if you believe that's Jesus, and what that does is invites them with an opportunity to think about Christ's present. You see, you want to invite the opportunity without giving undue offense when somebody comes to worship in, a, in an environment that they're not used to that understanding of the real presence. So it's something to cultivate. It's something to remember always Christ is present in all the tabernacles around the world now until the end of time. As much as we are in a crisis as a church, and divided along the lines of humana vitae primarily, along the division between the marital act and having children, which has really deepened the problems within our church. Even so, you have mass available to you. Think about that. It's very easy, really, to get to mass if you think about it, if you prioritize it, to get to a mass on a regular basis. That's a blessing. And while you have that gift, for as long as you have that gift, treasure it and take advantage of it as often as you can. Mental prayer during the day, 20 to 35 minutes. The rosary again. Remember the three great gifts of Christ as he prepares to ascend into heaven is himself in the Last Supper and the sacrifice of the cross where he gives us um, his very flesh and blood. His mother from the cross, where he says to John, the beloved disciple, behold your mother. And then, of course, in that same upper room where the Last Supper was celebrated, where Mary, 
the faithful women, the, the apostles and others gather in prayer to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? So we have the Holy Spirit, we have Christ, and we have Mary as our mother, our spiritual mother, okay? So all of that's a great gift that we have received from God. The rosary is a means of, through the beginning with vocal prayer, meditating, okay? So I've shared with you how I pray the rosary. Endorphins help me meditate, okay? So the way I actually pray the rosary each day is I need to stay fit, Every woman in the parish wants to feed me and get me fat. I say, you're not going to give me a heart attack. Every woman in Philadelphia has done that to her man, you know, because they view him Taylor pork roll, hoagies, pizza, and everything else. All these poor guys, 55, 60, having heart attacks. Not me, baby. Okay. So I'm making sure I exercise every day. I need to do that. But what I do is I say, well, hey, I need to pray the rosary every day. That gives me about 30 to 35 minutes. And what I do is I move through the entire rosary, but I only pray one of the four mysteries of the day. So this morning, I, I, I meditated on the joyful mysteries. I went through those. Then I meditated on the, uh, you know, illuminative mysteries. Then I meditated on the sorrowful mysteries. Then I actually prayed the glorious mysteries. And I can do all of that in about 32 minutes, okay? And what happens is as you're praying the endorphins get kicking in, and then you have all these insights and things. Because the human mind is not really one track. It's multidimensional. If you think about, like, think when you drive a car, there's tons of things you're thinking. You can be listening to the radio and everything, and it, you can actually do those things, okay? You are capable of not only saying a vocal prayer, but meditating simultaneous with that. Look, if I can do it, you can do it, okay? It's not that complicated. And this is something that John Paul II was pointing out to us. Don't just say the words, meditate on the words, and it can actually lead to contemplation, okay? It can actually lead to where windows that you didn't see before open up, and you're just communicating with God in a heart relationship. That happens, okay? That's not something that only people who spend time in the monastery can experience. And I will say this to you you're going to need to be seeking contemplation if you're going to be a person of substance in a world that doesn't know truth. Okay, The very meaning of words is being absolutely desecrated. We can't, even in our own language, we can't communicate because people are destroying language. And that is going to make it very hard because people will say a word and your child will be thinking it means this. It doesn't mean that at all because we live in a subjective culture. Whatever I think is just what I think. Whatever you think is you think. What is that? That's what we call alienation. It breeds malice. Okay. What are we about as a Catholic church? Many of you in this room do not speak English as your primary language. But what unites us is not our language, but the truth that we believe. The truth that we believe. The only communication is the truth. Christ is the word, the summation of all truth. That's the only communication. That's why we go to communion. Okay? That's why it's very significant. You need to know the truth. You can know it. And you need to know it because you're not getting it. Culturally, you are not getting it. Okay? The, the big debate now, the argument within the church about whether we actually use LGBTQ language is about the truth of language. And that's a non-negotiable dividing line. That the truth that Christ reveals. Do you not know that in the beginning, God made them male and female? That's the truth. That's it. That's a dividing line. It's about the truth. When we think of the truth, it's personal. It's Christ. And what we say, we will judge on. How we speak, how we see ourselves, how we talk about ourselves and talk about others is important. You're going to have to know, how, you're going to have to know a language. <laughs> Your kids are being given misinformation about language and they're being forced to speak in that false language. You used to fill out forms that said, what is your sex? Now what does it say? What is your gender? And I even hear priests who are educated using the word gender. 
not me. I will mark through the thing that says gender, I will put sex, and I will put male. Because that's the truth. That's the truth. We got to get informed about it. We really do because it's very subtle, it's very prevalent, and it's very confusing. We can't be confused. We cannot. We cannot afford to be. So, journal meditation. These ideas I'm coming up with, I, I get before the Blessed Sacrament. Okay. Meditate scripture. Talk to God. Write to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. He'll speak to you. You have a personal relationship with Jesus. Then you go, examination of conscience. Each of us is meant to be, by our baptism, priest, prophet, and king. Okay, this is very good. What you need to go into is look at the compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. In that, read the section from number 188 to 191 and memorize it. In that, you'll find what it says about you as a lay person, how you are a priest, a prophet, and a king. You should memorize all that. It tells you how you're supposed to participate at Mass and offer your life to God. It tells you how you're to preach the Word of God, and it tells you how you're to overcome sin. Okay, and, and this is what it means to be a, a priest, a prophet, and a king. And, and examination, your, examine your conscience. So, again, if you, if you can go where? To the Vatican website, the compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, numbers 188 to 199. Next week, I'm giving you a test, and you have to be able to give me the answer to the exact sections in the compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. No, actually, you don't need to do that. I just lied to you. That's terrible. I will confess that this week when I go to confession. <laughs> okay. Um, but that's, uh, it's, it, it really is that important. It, it's, it's so significant. And the thing is, when you read the compendium or the catechism, one of those sections you can meditate on a very long time. It's, it's really, we shouldn't run through these. Um, I've been teaching the catechism now for years to my, uh, to my high schoolers. I've been through the general catechism about three times now. Been through the compendium about three times. Every time I'm going back, I'm gleaning again and again from these rich uh, dogmatic statements that we've received from very intelligent and holy people. Okay, And these are great blessings for us. And so I just want to encourage you to really begin to use these resources because these resources really anoint and bless us in particular ways. So, these things, uh, priest, prophet, and king, sharing in Christ's priesthood by the grace of my baptism, have I offered all my life to God the Father by being Christ for others today. Because remember, at Mass, we're giving through Christ our very self to the Father and then through us, Christ gives himself to others. This is why he left. And what is that doing? That, that's your kenosis. That's how you empty yourself. You empty yourself in such a way by giving yourself back to the Father who gave you life here. And then by allowing Christ now to be alive through you for others. Does that make sense? And that's what it means to be, be Christ for others. That's why we were called at the first place in Antioch called Christians. Remember, Antioch's the first place that we were called Christians as individuals, and we were called Catholic as a church. That St. Ignatius of Antioch is the one who was martyred, and, and first time we have written where that label, that moniker is used for the universality of the Christianity that he's practicing, okay? So, priesthood. You're a priest in the ordinary sense. I'm a priest both in the ordinary sense and then also in the ordained sense. Next, sharing in Christ's prophetic power by the grace of my baptism, have I thought, spoken, and acted as a witness to Christ in his gospel? Remember, the, what we think in the memory is what is eventually going to become the act, action through the will, okay? And so today, have you done that? Remember, at Mass, we say, in my thoughts, in my words, in what I have done, and what I have failed to do. Okay, and that's, where, that's why the Mass begins with the Word to saturate the memory with the Gospel truth. So that is how our intellect operates based on that information, which is formation, so that we begin to act according to that message and develop uh, virtues rather than vices.
and then sharing in Christ's kingly power by the grace of my baptism. Have I overcome my own temptations and fought against sin in each encounter and activity this day? Um, whatever sin you're trying to overcome when you pray about it, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be tempted by that sin. I'm always scared to, to, to start new initiatives <laughs> because I, I could actually sense the vis, visual attack of the demon. Uh, so, but that's what we have to do. Nonetheless, we have to engage in that warfare. And so you have particular sins that you're aware of. You should be allowing the grace of God to help you overcome that. Think about this. If you, you feel like you're hurt, then you look at your wound. Does it increase or decrease the pain? It increases it. As soon as you say, oh my gosh, I am really hurt. Okay? If you actually examine your conscience and you find out, wait a minute, I am really sinning in this way. It, it freaks you out. That's okay. But why does God allow you to experience that? So that you know it's him and not you that overcomes the sin. That you know it's him, it's not you. So if you're seeking to overcome your root sin, expect to be tempted very powerfully. But also expect the power of God to help you overcome it. You shouldn't run away from looking at the wound, otherwise you'll never be healed. And that's what I think we should do with it in terms of that. Have I overcome my own temptations and fought against sin in each encounter and activity this day? Think about this. What if you spent your whole life just fighting against overcoming sin? That would be a holy life. <laughs> if you didn't give in, and somebody said, all you're doing is sitting there fighting. Yes, I'm fighting against sin. And then you died and you hadn't given in, that'd be a great life. How did Christ spend his last moments? fighting against your sin. He died fighting against sin. Okay, what, what do people do? Say, hey, listen, I'll be able to do so much more. I'll just keep sinning in this way and I'll just do other things because they're all good. Not as good as if you just fought against that sin. Fighting's good. This is what Jacob did with the angel, right? I don't think we think this way a lot of times. That's a very holy endeavor just to fight against sin. Why? Because our Savior did it. He's the victor over sin. There you go. That's why we think of sin a lot as Catholics. Because that's the whole reason our Savior came. You got Catholic guilt. Well, I'm guilty of sin in my Christ. He died to save me from it. Let us all stand now this morning as we're ready to go. We thank Dennis for his presentation today. And we thank the Lord for this beautiful, crisp weather that we have, the fall. Praise Jesus Christ, my favorite time of the year. If I weren't a priest, I would be gone the entire month of October. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord.